Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we're going to continue with uh, reading through and discussing the Steps to Christ, Ellen White. Uh, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. And we're thankful for this past week, the various blessings that we have received even through the trials that we have experienced. We know, Lord, that you sympathize with our suffering and that you have allowed uh, things to happen in our lives to awaken our consciences and awaken ourselves to our need of you. And we know that um, you, you speak to each person, each one of us as an individual, and that you value us and you are seeking to draw us closer to you. So we just pray, Lord, that through your spirit, as we read these words of encouragement and conviction, that, um, that we can be filled with your spirit. We pray for each person who's searching for truth. We just ask, Lord, that um, you can empower them, that you can, and that they, they can make a decision to follow you each step of the way. Uh, be with us now as we read and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, happy Sabbath to all who are here right now. To those, of course, who are watching later, it may not be Sabbath when you watch this, but uh, for us, the Sabbath is really a special time. And, and uh, the studies that we have during the week, you know, are enjoyable. But I always find on the Sabbath, especially on Friday evening as we bring in the Sabbath, that there is there is a special blessing. And it's, it's really important to just set aside all those worries and concerns of the week and to just receive what God wants us to receive. Now, Kelly was going to be reading, except that he's he's still driving right now. And uh, so he will, when he gets set up, I guess he can take over the reading. But for now, we're just going to start reading here. So chapter two, now we know the first chapter had to deal with God's love. And this chapter here, so that was God's love for man. And this chapter here is the sinner's need of Christ. And this originally was the first chapter of the book. But later on, they, they added that other chapter. So man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God, and his thoughts were pure, his aims holy. But through disobedience, his powers were perverted, and selfishness took the place of love. His nature became so weakened through transgression that it was impossible for him, in his own strength, to resist the power of evil. He was made captive by Satan and would have remained so forever had not God specially interposed. It was the tempter's purpose to thwart the divine plan in man's creation and to fill the earth with woe and desolation. And he would point to all this evil as the result of God's work in creating man. Now here, of course, we see elements of the great controversy between Christ and Satan being addressed, though not as specifically as that, and that the battleground is going to be over our mind, right? So we can see that that's that that's where this this battle is is waging. In his sinless state, man held joyful communion with him, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and that's from Colossians two verse three. But after his sin. He could no longer find joy in holiness, and he sought to hide from the presence of God. Such is still the condition of their unrenewed heart. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy in communion with him. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter heaven? It would have no joy for him. The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love, would touch no answering chord in his soul. 
His thoughts, his interests, his motives would be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. He would be a discordant note in the melody of heaven. Heaven would be to him a place of torture, and he would long to be hidden from him who is its light and the center of its joy. It is no arbitrary decree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for its companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction, that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. Now, when we think about heaven, just in a general sense, you know, the average person thinks about heaven, they think of it as what kind of place? I'm not talking necessarily about Advent, it's just the average sort of person. What's the sort of stereotypical idea of heaven? Floating around on clouds and playing harps. <laughs> okay, well, there's a little bit of that. But but that's more, you know, that's more the, like the worldly idea. I'm thinking more of like Christians' ideas. I mean, but it is a place of sort of self-indulgence, right? You know, you know, everything that you could ever want. You know, it's sort of this, this people have a, some sense of an, a fantasy of, you know, just wonderful things. Um, but they rarely think of heaven as a place of self-sacrifice, of selfless. I kind of get what you're saying. It's it's about them getting to heaven and having everything they ever wanted, a mm -hmm. beautiful home, a mansion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I've seen people talk, oh, the mansions, there's going to be a mansion in heaven. And, you know, I mean. I don't care about mansions now. Why would I care about mansions then? I mean, I, I would be looking forward to, to being outside and enjoying outside. <laughs> my, my idea of being in heaven when we get to build our own home, because we'll have a home in the New Jerusalem, and we'll also be able to build our own home somewhere, I think. But anyway, the way I'd like to build one out of living trees and just train the trees to be living walls and a living house of plants. Yeah. Just just a far-fetched idea. But. Yeah, I know. Uh, when I think about, um, uh, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. One person said, and I, I think he was maybe joking, but he said, you know, you know, you got like a mansion for the Pentecostals, a mansion for the Baptists, a mansion for... You know, so that we can all be sort of separate. And that's why it will be heaven, because we won't have to actually interact with each other, which I think is, is pretty silly. But I, I don't know what their point was. I think they were just trying to be funny. You know, when we think about the communion in heaven, that is the type of joy, the type of fellowship, we have experienced at times that that spirit of unselfish love that can unite us with others, right? All of us, I hope, have experienced that at times. That's not about us, but it's just, you know, true love, right? Caring for another human being. And, and, and you can see for many people that type of idea is foreign because we naturally – our nature is such, our sinful nature is such that we think about ourselves. And, and that is something that has to change. So when we think about a sinner, right? And she talks about sinners. You know, often we just think about sinners as, you know, people who rob banks or murder, right? We, we, we think of these extreme sins, but we don't really think about ourselves as sinners. I'm just talking in the general sense. You know, people generally consider themselves good. Even people in prison consider themselves good. Even, you know, criminals consider themselves good, right? You know, on some level, there's something that they don't do. They have some code in which generally that they're going to fit into, some way in which we can justify ourselves. And so if we really understood what God has prepared for us what our purpose is it's quite different than what we 
imagine for ourselves. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that's a quote from Job 14.4 and Romans 8.7. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior. But they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God, to holiness. Now, when we think about this, and, and, and I've thought about this quite a bit in, in my life, about what what God's power is. So, you know, we all know, you know, willpower in and of itself, you know, uh, is it has its place, right? But it it's not strong enough. Our will is not strong enough to overcome our nature because our nature has its own will as well. That is very powerful. But then when we think about the power of Christ, well, how do we access the power of Christ? Where does it come from? I mean, it's not like, you know, we're just sitting there praying and we say, okay, God, you have this power. I don't have it. And, you know, I want your power. And he somehow gives it to us. Because there is a practical way in which that power comes to us. And how does it come to us? I would say the study of the Bible. Okay, right. Through his word, his powerful word right? The word of his power. So that is all of the Christian experience that we have comes from a study of God's word. Now, of course, it can have, you know, nature is is also God's lesson book. Right? There are things that, that we can see in nature and we can all have a conviction that what we are doing is wrong and and we can call out to God and he can help us. But it is intertwined with the revelation that comes from God's word, that's where the power comes from. So people who have studied the Bible and and start to read it and accept what it's saying, they receive this conviction and this power, right? Jesus says, I'll send you another comforter and he shall convict the world of sin of righteousness and judgment. Right? The Holy Spirit, this three steps, convict, conviction of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. It comes from his word, but we say it's the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit comes to us through God's word, right? So, I mean, obviously God can, where people don't have access to the Bible, speak to them directly and, and give it impressions that are going to bring conviction and power in a person's life. But we, we also when it comes to the Holy Spirit coming to us, it is through the words of Christ that we receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> the Savior said, except a man be born from above, unless he shall receive a new heart, new desires, purposes, and motives, leading to a new life, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The idea that it is necessary only to develop the good that exists in man by nature is a fatal deception. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Of Christ it is written, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The only name under heaven given among men where my, whereby we must be saved. Okay, so what does it mean to be born again? What What is she talking about here? How is she understanding, except a man be born from above, except a man be born again? What is it that, that we need? Anybody? 
I would think we need a repentant heart. Oh, okay. We need a new heart. Yeah. Okay. So we have a sinful nature. Now, we know that when we are converted, we don't get a sinless nature, right? Like, it's not like being born again. Some people have the idea that being born again is I get a new nature. That is, that is my sinful nature is changed to a sinless nature. That, that some people have that idea. Okay. But, but that's not what it's talking about. We know that the natural man, we're still going to be natural men, even when we're born again. That is, remember when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What was, what was Nicodemus's response? Like what's behind it? How can a man be born again when he's already been born? Yeah. Okay. Just, you know. Now, now it is true that he is, in a sense, he knows what he's saying is ridiculous, right? He's trying to make what Jesus is saying is ridiculous by saying, "How can a man enter into his mother's womb?" But what he is 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 actually saying is, "Well, you know, I am who I am. I have this nature. I'm not going to get a different nature. How can you really be talking about being born again?" Now, of course, Jesus is not talking about our physical body being born again, right? He's talking about our mind, right? That is, there is a change that happens. We don't get rid of our sinful nature, but we do receive something that, that, that changes our relationship with God. It changes our relationship with sin. And that would be a new mind, right? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Jesus had, Jesus in a sense was born, born again. That is, he had the same body you and I have, but he had the mind of God. He had the mind of Christ. And, and so that's something that has to happen to us to be born again. Right. So here, we're going to read another paragraph and Hi, Stephen. It's obviously pretty early in the morning where you are. Nice to see you. Yep. <laughs> it is not enough to perceive the loving kindness of God, to see the benevolence, the fatherly tenderness of his character. It is not enough to discern the wisdom and justice of his law, to see it is founded upon the eternal principle of love. Paul the Apostle saw all this when he exclaimed, I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. But he added in the bitterness of his soul anguish and despair, I am carnal, sold under sin. He longed for the purity, the righteousness, to which in himself he was powerless to attain and cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Such is the cry that has gone up from the burdened hearts in all lands and in all ages. To all, there is but one answer. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So in this, and we've gone through Romans 7. So the idea here is we can consent unto the law that it is, is holy. You know, this reminds me of an illustration. Um, uh, there used to be on radio, and probably many of you have heard of Dr. Laura Schlesinger, but this would be about like 30 some years ago. She used to have uh, a very popular radio talk show. And it was always interesting to me that people, people would phone up to ask advice. Now she was Jewish, you know, and, and they would have some moral issue that she would give an answer to. And people, would acknowledge, you know, what good is, right? Like they would like her show. They appreciate the advice she gives others. Um, but it's not enough just to know what good is, you know, what is good. Because they would say, oh, I appreciate that. And then, but here's my situation. And then their situation would be they have not followed at all what they believe to be right. And and are wondering about the consequences of their actions. How can they get rid of those consequences of their actions? And so it, it's easy for a person to recognize that there is right, there is a right way to go, 
but it's much more difficult to do. And, you know, it, it always struck me, you know, because almost every case was the same. We all know what that the law is holy, the commandment holy, just and good. But, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of, of this death? And, you know, now we also in our study, we showed that, that Jesus had that same nature, right? So this, this was part of Jesus's experience. That is, it's, it's not saying here, uh, that, that Paul is just continually sinning. You know, that's, that's not what he's describing here. You know, I would that I would, but I do not that which I would and so forth that I do not do. Anyway, it's rather sort of a tongue twister sort of explanation. But he's talking about the flesh. That is, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I know not, or I find not. And so we all have had this experience. And it is always to be true that I know that in me dwells no good thing. Now, to know that is through the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Right? Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot know what is good, but that's not enough. We need, we need to connect with God. We need that power. Many are the figures by which the Spirit of God has sought to illustrate this truth and make it plain to the souls, plain to souls that long to be freed from the burden of guilt. When after his sin in deceiving Esau, Jacob fled from his father's home. He was weighed down with a sense of guilt. Lonely and outcast as he was, separated from all that had made his life dear. The one thought that above all others pressed upon his soul was the fear that it, that his sin had cut him off from God, that he was forsaken of heaven. In sadness, he laid down to rest on the bare earth around him only the lonely hills, and above, the heavens bright with stars. As he slept, a strange light broke upon his vision, and lo, from the plain on which he lay, uh, vast shadowy stairs seemed to lead up toward the very gates of heaven, and upon them angels of God were passing up and down, while from the glory above the divine voice was heard in a message of comfort and hope. Thus was made known to Jacob, that which met the need and longing of the, his soul, a savior. With joy and gratitude, he saw revealed a way by which he, a sinner, could be restored to communion with God. The mystic ladder of his dream represented Jesus, the only medium of communication between God and man. Now, of course, you know, Jacob's ladder, very famous, even many non-Christians and non-believers would know about Jacob's ladder, uh, you know, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Though there's a song like that. Though are we climbing Jacob's ladder? There's angels ascending and descending upon Jacob's ladder, upon the Son of Man. So, and Jesus is going to refer that to that with Nathaniel in the next paragraph. Maybe we'll read that and have a little discussion on it. <clears throat> Elamite, she connects it to. Peter's letter, where it talks about adding on to your godliness, brotherly kindness. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. This is the same figure to which Christ referred in his conversation with Nathaniel when he said, Ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, that's from John chapter 1 for 51. In the apostasy, man alienated himself from God. Earth was cut off from heaven. Across the gulf lay that lay between, there could be no communion. But through Christ, earth is again linked with heaven. With his own merits, Christ has bridged the gulf which sin has made so that the ministering angels can hold communion with him. Christ connects fallen man in his weakness and helplessness with the source of an infinite power. So we know it's through Christ taking upon himself man's nature and its fallen condition that unites that nature to God. So Christ is that example. He is that ladder. He's 
the God man, right? He connects heaven and earth. Now, uh, you're saying, Stephen, that Ellen White connects this with with Peter's ladder, add to your grace, etc., right? or to your faith and to your grace. I can't remember how it, how it goes, but you add these different elements. Now, those all come how? So how is Christ a ladder in this context? So we, we, we know that it represents his human and divine nature, but just in a practical sense. Like Stephen, can you sort of explain what Ellen White says about that and how, how you understand it? She talks about these here, like virtue and godliness being rungs on the ladder. Yeah. We climb heavenward. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Christ so, that came down, touches touches the earth. Yeah. And then so, he reaches onto heaven, yeah. the Father's throne. Okay. So so we're not like actually climbing a ladder, literally. Right? It's it's a figure. Okay. Yes, but we are, yeah. So, so what does that mean in, in sort of practical terms? Like, what is Christ doing that connects us to heaven, and how does that occur in our lives? That we're looking heaven, heavenward towards him. And okay, so... On the ladder. No kidding, no. So, we have, so we have these sort of, like, like phrases and things that we use, I, I call them platitudes, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they they do mean something. They're not meaningless platitudes. But sometimes they they lose their meaning in overuse. So I, I want to just think about this in a very practical sense. Like, and I think Peter's ladder um, gives us the, this sense. So we could call this this ladder really steps to Christ, couldn't we? Yes. Okay. Right. So so we should be able to see instead of just this sort of abstract idea, uh, we should be able to see practical things that occur. In in our experience that recognize that we are on that we are connecting with heaven, that it doesn't just happen in an instant that everything is done. Right. You know, because Jesus came and died for our sins and we can accept Jesus as our savior. But there are some people who just leave it at that, right? It's like, you know, if you say the sinner's prayer, then you're saved. And and we don't really find that in Scripture, that that's all there is to it. Like, well, the Scripture says he that, you know, believes in the Lord Jesus. Um, I can't remember the whole thing, how it goes. But it says he shall be saved. It does not say that he is saved, right? Now, Obviously, Jesus has come and died for us and in Christ. We are saved, but we recognize that there is there is a walk that we go through. Now, part of what um, one of the reasons, you know, I've been looking at Steps to Christ just has to do with Kelly's experience, um, you know, through uh, the 12 steps. Now, Kelly, I don't know how your connection is right now where you are, but could you. Can you give some practical examples of what you, how you understand this connection? I don't know if you're the connection of adding, adding to our, our. I just posted a quote actually. How's my connection coming through now? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. So this yeah. quote is from. Um, Letters and manuscripts. So manuscript uh, 164, 1907, paragraph 13. Is that what it is? It looks like. Uh, I, I can read it if you like, or it's a little long, maybe. I don't know. And I'm I'm ready to read. I I, I pulled yeah, over okay. so I can read. join. Yeah, can read this. yeah, read this this quote. Okay, just give me a second. I'll get back to it. Well, now, here, here is the word. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Virtue is character. It is a duty of every man and woman before me to understand that they have a mind which is an accountability to God and that they are to preserve that mind, that it shall speak intelligently, that it shall work for their benefit, and 
as it works in the virtue of character for their benefit, that very virtue is an influence in a community. It, it is telling its story on the right side. Now, here is where the addition should be. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Why is it impossible for a man to have knowledge and at the same time pursue a course in which he sacrifices his virtue and destroys his nerve power? Okay, Kelly? Yeah, okay. I just got back. Okay. Give me a second. I'm going to move a little bit. I'll read the rest of this book, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, please. If he does so, he is adrift. Um, God wants every nerve of our brain preserved in the most sacred manner. Why? With the mind, we serve the law of God and and the scriptures. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I quite understand part of this. Why is it impossible for a man to have knowledge and at the same time to pursue a course in which he sacrifices his virtue and destroys his nerve power? Right. I mean, obviously, it it's impossible for him to have this knowledge and pursue a course in which he sacrifices his virtue uh, without going adrift, I kind of think. So this must be from her morning talks or something, or it says letters and manuscripts, but it seems more like it's something she was saying, right? It, not something she wrote. So it could be why the sentence doesn't make sense to me. But uh, there is a natural progression in which these steps uh, repeat in our lives, right? That is, it's not like we have one step, we get to that step, and then we get, and we never come back to that step again. In a sense, this this is part of a process as we continue our walk with Christ. Any thoughts on this, this quote? Okay. Well, I'm going to read the next paragraph of Kelly's. Kelly's getting ready there, I guess, getting set up with the other, with the computer or something. But in vain are men's dreams of progress. In vain, all efforts for the uplifting of humanity, if they neglect the one source of hope and help for the fallen race. Every good gift and perfect gift is from God. There's no true excellence of character apart from him. And the only way to God is Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if we're looking at this virtue that we need to add to our faith virtue, that virtue cannot be attained apart from Christ, right? That there's this progression. The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love stronger than death. In giving up his son, he has poured out to us all heaven in one gift, the Savior's life and death and intercession. The ministry of angels, the pleading of the spirit, the father working above and through all the unceasing interest of heavenly beings. All are enlisted in behalf of man's redemption. See how much we're almost done this chapter. Okay, I'm just going to keep reading. Oh, let us contemplate the amazing sacrifice that has been made for us. Let us try to appreciate the labor and energy that heaven is expending to reclaim the lost and bring them back to the Father's house. Motives stronger and agencies more powerful could never be brought into operation. The exceeding rewards for right doing, the enjoyment of heaven, the society of angels, the communion and love of God and his Son, the elevation and extension of all our powers throughout eternal ages. Are these not mighty incentives and encouragements to urge us to give the heart's loving service to our creator and redeemer. And on the other hand, the judgments of God pronounced against sin, the inevitable retribution, the degradation of our character, and the final destruction are presented in God's word to warn us against the service of Satan. So we have these two things that we need to contemplate. Everything that God is doing now, do we appreciate everything that God is doing on our behalf? We should, but not half of it. Really. I don't think it's possible for us to know and understand what God has suffered 
in seeking to redeem us. I mean, we could compare it to a mother's love, you know, you know, there's lots of things we can compare it to, but you know, it's a love stronger than death, but that still doesn't tell us everything, you know, and there are people that we love and that we long to see saved and that we, or, or people that, you know, we, we labor over, but God does so much more than what we have done. But at least we can look at, at the love that God has put in our hearts and we can we can see to some degree what God must feel towards us. Not that love is just a feeling. Okay, Kelly, you're all set up there. You put another quote there. Review on the Herald, July 6, 1905, paragraph three. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm ready. Hopefully my signal stays. Yeah. I'll read that quote. Yeah. Who she's speaking to here is students in school. Okay. Young men, young men and women in school. They okay. will find that by, they will find that by imparting truth, they will increase in a knowledge of Christ. They can be channels of light. Said Christ, ye are the light of the world. When you get a fresh thought from the word of God, or from your other studies. Do not keep them to yourself. Give to someone else that which has helped you. Remember that as surely as you live out the principles of truth, you will help yourself. And in helping yourself to climb the ladder of progress, you will show others the way. That's a pretty good one. Especially, like, there's so many illustrations of, you know, the Dead Sea doesn't have water, has water coming in, but doesn't have water going out. So it it's only receiving and in nature. Oh, Kelly disappeared. Yeah. So so in order to to give, we or to receive, we must give. You know, yeah. I, mean, I, in order I still to think give, we must receive. And yeah. It's just a circle of cycle of life, and we see it everywhere in nature. Yeah, and it's only 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 the heart of man that is that doesn't without God. But it's so strange. I mean, when you think about it, um, how how we try to hold on to things and not give things. You know, well, what is the proverb? There is. There is he who gathers, I'm paraphrasing, gathers everything to himself and he's poor. And there's he who gives everything and he's rich. It's, yeah. Yeah. Something to affect that he that gathers much has little. And I can't remember exactly how it goes, but I know the one you're talking about. So. Yeah. Yeah. The principle. Proverb. Proverbs. Proverb. Proverb. Yeah. But I mean, it's a principle of life. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, we can uh, keep everything to ourselves and be rich and increased with goods, but poor in spirit. That's, that's where the true riches are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway. I, I think of quite a bit just because, you know, there's situations that I, the situation that I'm in where, you know, people, and, and we talked a bit about like not giving up on people and, and maybe it wasn't fully understood, but to me, um, you know, this is what God is doing, is he's not giving up on us. He's giving everything of himself. And we often want to protect ourselves, right? And and I understand it. But often the situations that, that exist, we in a sense have caused them. We, we think that the cause is someone else. We haven't recognized our part that we play in in what is happening to us. That, you know that even when bad things happen, they're not, they can never really truly be bad. If, if we all things, yeah, yeah, again, all. again, scripture, all things yeah. work together for good to those that love God. Yeah. And, and those even that, that we his purpose. called according to his purpose. And, and even that we fall so short in loving God. And, I mean, before this uh, time in my life, say, five years ago when mm -hmm. i when i would i i don't know i felt like 
it wasn't an sincere or deep enough to say, I love you, God. I, I didn't even say that. I'd, I'd just say, I love God. Well, and I'd joke about it because a friend of mine said, you know, Jesus loves you. And he loves to say that all the time, you know, just loves to remind people. So I have a thing, a, a fridge magnet that says, Jesus loves you. I gave him this. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. Uh, but really, now, though, having gone through being laid in the dust, my pr everything in my life, mm -hmm. and uh, experiencing redemption again, and, why, yeah. now when I say I love God, I love him. Yeah. Yeah. And and we know of course those that that um I can't remember how it goes, but about those that are for that need to be forgiven much, love much, something to that effect. Um and those who are forgiven much, love much. Yeah. But it's not who, are, I, yeah. Okay, go on. Go ahead. Um and it's not so much that we you know, we we want to do good, you know, that God's grace may abound. You know, shall we continue to sin that God's grace may abound? The reality is we are sinners and we need to recognize this. Like, but often we we want to we want to make ourselves look look good so that God will love us. Right? Mm. I, I think one of the reasons that that it's difficult or one of the things that gets in the way of seeing ourselves as sinners is we think of sin as simply an act, an action, doing yeah. something or not doing something. But sin is inside of us. It, it's an infection that infects our minds and our hearts that is summed up in selfishness. And, and to truly love and be able to, to have that love, there's no greater love that a man has than to lay his life down for a friend. Now, the, the way that I try to look at sins because of how it's presented in the Bible, sin is the transgression of the law. That is the only definition given in Scripture. Yet it comes from a heart that is separated from God. Sin is the symptom of a disease, Right. Sin is not the disease itself. Right. And, and that the law, transgression of the law, it, the, Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments as two commandments of love, love to God and love to man. So it's not loving. Sin is, is the opposite of love. Or mm. selfishness is the opposite of love. And, and the Ten Commandments are basically describing what it is to love or not love. But, you know, people think that they can get rid of the disease by stopping the symptoms. Right. Which we can't, right? And that's how we have approached in our lives generally is we, we have these, these sins, and so we start tackling the sins one at a time without it attacking the root cause of why we sin. I call it white knuckled righteousness, white knuckling righteousness by faith. You know, hanging on and clenching our fists and you know, setting our jaw to do what is right. And, and that's only in our own power that we're doing that. Yeah. Really. No, there's not, there's nothing wrong with trying to stop from doing things that are bad, right? So well, <laughs> so, yeah. so when we're doing something that's bad, we need to put an effort into it, right? But otherwise, we also, yeah, yeah. otherwise, we're like a man tossed about on the waves of the ocean. Yeah, so so we don't just allow, so, well, I can't overcome sin. You know, I'm just going to trust in Christ. I'm not going to make any effort to to change my life. No. You, you well, make that's, those where, that's where Morris Fenden got it wrong. Yeah, yeah, I know. He just thought yeah. something magical would happen if I just contemplated God's love. No, you have to yoke up with Christ. You have to learn in the school of Christ. You have to fail in order to succeed, in order to recognize how sinful you really are. If you never make a struggle against sin, 
you can convince yourself you're really not that bad. If you're always giving in to sin, you, you can you can justify all of your actions. But as you seek to to walk the Christian life, there is a struggle. So these often when we're talking about the, these things, they're not the they, you know, we have these sort of simple kind of, you know, sayings and, and ideas. And yet there's there's a depth that we need to comprehend which which I believe the book Steps to Christ really brings out. But she's going to talk about the exercise of the will. You know, that there's a correct exercise of the will, a right so exercise. I like, I like what you're saying, you know, about the struggle, because the in the struggle for me to break free of my addictions last year, mm-hmm. I was so humbled that by it. That, and, it and it was... The, the it was the most difficult time of my life, and now I'm I've broken free of it. I have no desire to go back because of that struggle. Remembering, like uh, in Job, God says to him, "He's wrestling. He's wrestling with Leviathan, the sea monster, mm-hmm. and he wins." But he says, "Remember the battle. Do not do it again." And uh, so. In that struggle, yeah, that's that's how we that's how we do need to enter into that battle. But we don't. It's like God says, stand and see, and God will fight for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's that it's, standing, staying in the battle, stay in the battle, stay in the thick of the battle. Yeah, and to know that God's working on our behalf in everything that he can possibly do, but there are things that he cannot do. God cannot choose for us, right? Which when we get into the right exercise of the will, that has to do with the ch- with choices that we make, not what we would call willpower, right? Yeah, um, the right exercise of the will. We don't understand yeah. what that is, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, I, I was going to say, I was going to say, like, with with the drugs and alcohol addictions, that struggle was difficult for me. But the one that was even harder, and it took me another five years back in 2001 to 2005, uh, was tobacco. I mean, be, one reason being that it seemed to be, well, it is more of a socially acceptable and not so much anymore kind of a little yeah. bit of a leper now but but yeah and that was the most difficult one and i remember the day that i got that victory mm-hmm. it was december 1st 2000 flies i had thrown away so many packs of cigarettes and uh you know i'd, I'd bum one at work or buy a pack on the way home every day and i remember sitting there and just crying man I was so so discouraged Mm -hmm. and God said throw them away man I got angry (laughs) I said I've done that throw them away I'll help you throw them away and I did you know and and I wasn't like it all of a sudden got easy but you know I threw them away that day December 1st 2005 and I quit for 15 years and the thing is is I don't know. Sometimes the smaller things, well, we look at less, less or degrees of sin, but sometimes the smaller things can hang on to us even with a stronger grip because they're, I don't know why exactly. Probably, I don't know why. Easier to coast along. They don't have as huge of a consequence right away. It's the consequences of sin that drive us to desire to give them up it's that's part of it as well as seeing the love of god for us it's it's the love of god that that gives us a hatred for the things that hurt us and hurt others yeah yeah tobacco is a tough one i remember when my son matt started smoking i said matt you're not going to be able to stop and it was like oh yeah i'll be able to stop but no you know, if I want to stop, 
but it it's probably the toughest battle he ever had um stopping smoking alcohol was easier for him than smoking yeah but um yeah. you know that 18 year old thinking you know he's he he he's in charge he's tough but but the strongest man is no match for for addictions Ten foot tall and bulletproof. Yeah, yeah. The the young who who are invincible. You know, they think they can they can dally with sin, but but the reality is these things can can grab a hold of us. And but we don't know why we do things. Right. That's really the root of it. Like, why do I enjoy this sin? Why do is does it it capture me? And um, you know, it's our relationship with God that that is going to to help us. Uh, without knowing God, we we definitely we might be able to change some things in our lives, right? Some people have, you know, pretty strong characters, and they can they can stop doing a lot of things, but there's still going to be sin just you know rooted in there that's going to manifest itself in ways that we don't, don't expect. And so as, as you know, Christians often we're unconverted. We don't know it, right? Because we don't do certain things. And so we think ourselves righteous, but the weightier matters of the law, we don't do. We, we tie them mint and cumin or cumin or whatever it is, but you know, love and mercy we don't have. That that why a couple of things from my experience is the why is there there's one uh, lack of connection either with God or others or it's with both there's a lack of connection like a intimate connection uh, relationship and, and and also there's a payoff. There's the pleasures of sin that we enjoy. And part of that really, pleasure is... The pleasures are really temporary and fleeting, though. Well, that's why smoking is so difficult, because you're one after another. You keep getting that pleasure until they start tasting bad. Or, yeah. But there, there, there's also, also very good science to this that I've learned about the dopamine response in the brain. And the things that stimulate dopamine, yeah. the chemical response, and that 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 in itself is is addictive. So, when we take away that substance or action that creates dopamine, the act itself, even some acts, then then we need to replace it. And God replaces that with a connection with Him, mm -hmm. and also it's replaced through connection in community. And it's also replaced with good things like exercise and eating properly and taking care of ourselves. But the the bridge is the part that getting over that bridge when we stop the one and replace it. That I'm telling you, it's like having lead filled boots and and uh, having being strapped to my bed some days. I just don't have the motivation even to get up and do that. But once I do it, taking the first step, you know, get me in motion and I keep going. It's like perpetual motion. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to stop me, but getting. Oh, Kelly disappeared. Oh, he's back again. Yeah, I'm back again. But getting that dopamine response going again, that's that's the trick. And it, and it takes community. It takes counseling. It takes help of others. We're not saved alone. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's obviously dopamine uh, that that you know that is you know I have joy and peace and you know in my relationship with God in spite of what's happening around me. But the thing is, even if I wasn't feeling good, you know, because there are things that can happen we don't really feel good, we can still we can still know to do right because we can step outside of that immediate situation and look at things in a broader picture. And so often we're, we're just caught in that moment and, 
have a hard time stepping. So there's there's a lot that goes into it as well. But I'm going to read this last paragraph here. Just, just, just a comment on that to add to that idea, because I agree, you know, um, and it is through the agency of the Holy Spirit, that quote, uh, I see it in the exact way, but bringing the thoughts and feelings, our thoughts and feelings, under the control of reason and conscience, and then our actions will be right. And that's only through the Holy Spirit. That's a, It's yeah. a miracle. Yeah, it yeah, is. But a cooperation and, of human and divine. Yes. Okay. So shall we not regard the mercy of God? What more could he do? Let us place ourselves in right relation to him who has loved us with amazing love. Let us avail ourselves of the means provided for us that we may be transformed into his likeness and be restored to fellowship with the ministering angels, to harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. Right? Now, this is, of course, the sinner's need of Christ. That's the chapter title. And we can see that that need is, is not some abstract thing about Jesus just dying for our sins. It's something that's very real. To know God is a very real thing just as to know anyone else. And, and many Christians don't know God. That is, they know about him. They know sort of what's required. They're part of a community like the church and so forth. But they don't know God himself. They don't have that, that true harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. And so because of that, the Christian life is, is very flaccid. You know, it's just, it's weak, it's powerless. And, and so we go, and, and we're talking about ourselves. We, we come into an experiences where, you know, God shows us because of his mercy and love. He's constantly seeking to save us that, that, uh, we, we need him. So, um, there's another thought. I can't skip my mind. I had this thought and it just, Disappear. Might come back if I stop trying to think about it. So anyway, as we look at these different steps, you know, repentance and confession, these are things that happen again and again in our Christian experience. They become deeper. So it's not like, you know, you get to one step and it's just you never come back to that step again. We, in a sense, every day we come to Christ the same way that we came to him at the beginning. And, and that's going to be, of course, later on in the book. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I'm exhausted. I'm thinking of the question, what does it mean to God? And the verse that comes to mind is 1 John 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Mm -hmm. So knowing God is loving God, loving mm -hmm. others. That's, that's how we can know that, that, that we're coming to a knowledge of God, to have an unselfish love for others and, and ourself. I, I struggle with that. Yeah, well, and it, it's God's love that does that, right? Like, we, you know, it's not yeah. like God loves us and then we, we, we just are, because we're not love. God is love. We are not love. Right, we're yeah. actually with with God, yeah. right? in our nature. So, so that transformation that happens is God's love is infused in the life through these experiences, uh, through His Word, through the the steps that we take in in playing the part the part that we have to play in our salvation, that walk that we have, yoking up with Christ. All of these active verbs of things that we have to do where many people look at, you know, many Christians have just this sort of passive thing. God loves us. He died for us. Just acknowledge it and you're saved. And, and yet we're not changed. And if we're not changed, we're not going to want to be in heaven, right? We're not going to enjoy the fellowship of heaven. So, so God needs to change us. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 
it's the, the hard the hard part is is uh the how you know for us to figure out the how and, and practice yeah. the how um, yeah and and beloved let us love one another for love is of god and everyone that loves is born of god and knows god he that loves not knows not god for god is love in this was manifest the love of god toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Mm -hmm. And Kelly disappeared again. <laughs> okay, Kelly, you're back. Yeah. That's that's just what I wanted to last yeah. thought on that about knowing God. It's it's loving, yeah. loving each other, loving God. Okay. Well, did you want to close with a word of prayer, Kelly? How is my signal? Not it's garbled. Strong when you're here. Okay. Sure. All right. Well, let's pray. Our loving. Heavenly Father, we do love you because when you come to us and show us our true condition, we see our desperate need. And we're so thankful that you hang on to us with a firmer grip than, than we can even cling to you in our desperate sense of our need. Thank you for the blessing of Scripture and the Holy Spirit that makes it come alive to us, makes it a thing that changes us. Help us to uh, call it to mind and in our struggles and in, in our joys even, to remember where all good things come from you and to be grateful, thankful, a heart of gratitude. I pray for each one here in, that's in the study tonight, Lord. We each have our own personal, personal battles because we're born in sin, Lord, and this condition is hopeless without Jesus. And we're so thankful to be changed into his likeness, to love each other, to love you. What a, what a beautiful thing. We thank you in his name, in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our best friend. Amen. Amen.